are all full of challenge and failure and surprise and calls and opportunity for change. My mother's name was Ka Koi, Irma Daisy Hayes. My grandmother's name was Sao Lu, Ruth Willard Hayes. My great grandmother's name was Ka Steen, Annie Edwards Willard. My great great grandmother's name has not yet been revealed to me. My real grandmother died when my mother was a baby. Her name was Shanka Sucht, and I carry her name. Generations before now, five clan sisters traveled north from the original town, not far from the place that is now called Sitka, for purposes of marriage. Each of these five clan sisters held fast to the intention of strengthening clan alliance. Each of them held fast with the northern Gnachtebi who lived in the village of Koko. Mm -hmm. Travel in those days was a matter of planning, just as it is today. Alliances in those days were matters of order and politics, just as they are today. Marriage in those days was a matter of resolve that all too often those five sisters went north to carry out their responsibilities and their journey was conducted in the spirit of love. Young in years, they blushed and cast their eyes downward at the thought of meeting the men they would marry. Noble in birth, they did not sit still when there was work to be done. Prosperous in circumstance, they were generous with their supplies at the camps and villages at which they stopped along the way. Trade and King and Ani had made strong clans stronger, rich clans more wealthy. Since the Wolf Clan's birth had come to pass after the disruptive events that occurred generations before in a grassy place, the clan and the Wolf House after it had by bold choices and decisive encounters earned the respect of their allies and the fear of those who challenged them. Even the people of the raven boat, even the bitter water, even the brown bear. When the waters could be expected to remain in the commas, when Koho and their brothers and sisters could still be found swimming in the streams in numbers great enough to provide their own lives for the travelers' sustenance, when summer was waning but not yet complete, when late berries were still flirtatious and fattened bears who were not quite as cross as they had been, before the seasons turned and winds whispered hints of the coming weather, Five clan sisters packed the best of their own belongings, packed gifts from their loved ones to be given to distant relatives and to families of the five sisters' husbands, to pack weapons and food and blankets and furs and cherished treasures, pack beloved memories and lost hopes and melancholy regrets and childhood wishes and a firm resolve to find solace in the knowledge of duty accomplished, filled their boxes with treasure and knowledge and wisdom and tradition, and traveled north for the purpose of marriage. Their last glimpse of those places when they came from were full of familiar love. Over there, the place where the best sockeye filled the stream. Over there, a place where the thickest salmon berries were 
known to go up. Past that island, the busy hung out for seals. At the northernmost point of the promontory, rocks that caught and held on to the finest black seaweed. Not far from the inlet by which they now passed a long, wide beach of muck where the largest cockles, the most delicious clams, the most tender beach asparagus, waited for the people's grateful harvest. <clears throat> and here, Pat was meant to take these five sisters to their destinies at the edge of that growing, spreading, lively, and get on me. Here, the way that is meant to take these sisters and all their children and all their children's children into an unknowable future. My Aunt Agnes Bellinger liked to tell me the story of those sisters and name the families who were their matrimonial descendants. I don't know how many generations before that the sisters traveled north, but I do know that one of those matrilineal lines links to my great-grandmother Carter Steen, Annie Edwards Willard, buried in a family plot in, well, what we now think of as Juno's Old Cemetery. Juno's first western-styled cemetery used to be up at the top of Main Street on the hill now called Chicken Ridge. When then new Evergreen Cemetery, this was in the late 1800s, opened for business, so to speak, <laughs> people moved graves from Chicken Ridge downhill to the new cemetery, and it wasn't long before the Chicken Ridge hillside was divided into lots where Juno's rich people <coughs> could build big homes that looked down on the rest of the town. But it turned out that not all the graves had really been moved. People began to find body parts <coughs> and clothing mixed in with the excavated dirt. They saw coffins that were shut down below. Pieces, a piece of scalp that had brown hair still clinging to it. Native people whose relatives were being desecrated in that way complained to official white men. Those complaints were signed by Harry Phillips, Jimmy Young, Fanny Rudolph, Mr. and Mrs. Jack Yaquan, and Annie Willard. The original people traditionally cremated their dead, sending along personal effects to ease the coming journey and bringing favorite food from time to time to satisfy appetites not subdued by death. But the practice of cremation was seen as crude and unchristian by the missionaries who came early to save souls and to obliterate non-Christian customs. The forced custom of burying bones and flesh and holding it down with heavy stone successful spiritual conversion from heathen ways. An official, a white minister, missionary at the time, noted the irony of first enforcing Christian burial and then digging up the bodies and throwing the bones over the hillside to make room for big houses. As people tried to find their once-buried loved ones, a relative of Chief Johnson was recognized by the handmade blanket that had been buried with him. Playthings and a bottle of medicine were said to belong to three children by the name of Jackson. One man was recognized by his burial clothes. Two blankets, a pair of slippers, his trousers, decorated glove, his leather shoes. Somebody found a mitten 
with part of a hand still inside. But no one could be sure whose flesh still gripped the beaded cloth. This disrespect was no surprise. The colonial narrative at the time taught that indigenous beliefs, practices, and customs were without value. And indigenous people were pretty much wrong about everything, including all their customs, practices, and beliefs, especially the cultural narrative that had to do with the beloved land. The Chicken Ridge grave sites were on private land, so permission had to be given by those private landowners before any native person could search for the remains of their brothers, grandmothers, wives, children, husbands, mothers. One woman who could no longer find a trace of her loved one that she had seen asked a question that even now remains unanswered. White men crowd natives out from the land on which their very homes stand. Will they not even allow our dead to have a resting place? Anna Willard is now buried in that evergreen cemetery where people whose names appear on streets, towns, islands, history books, and Chicken Ridge mailboxes rest not far from the long fallen now buried headstone that marks her own family plot. From time to time I've asked people to imagine what would happen if in just a few years the culture we now live in, the shared narrative against which our stories now unfold, was suddenly subdued by people who believed theirs was a superior way of being. Theirs was the only true faith. Their God, the only God. Their language, the only worthwhile speech. Their version of history, the only one that mattered. Even before the Chicken Ridge Cemetery desecration, it was the colonial practice to rummage through graves and pit through human remains, looking for artwork and curiosities to collect. If in a few years, people who are alive today witness the graves of their loved ones being ransacked on the side of a hill, the bones of their loved ones examined and cataloged and stolen, even their bones, what effect would that have? What trauma would be caused by that one arrogant, hostile, colonial practice? I value the lesson that such a story offers, this story about the treatment of our dead, because it shows how quickly the narrative that gives context to our lives can change. Here's another story. One time, a man by the name of Young Tom was living in a church basement so he could stay sober and see his little girl, Patricia, who was now living in the Fosby apartments with a white lady named Mabel. Young Tom didn't know exactly how it happened, but he knew his wife, Lucille, had left town while he was out fishing, and Patricia was feeding herself while she was waiting for someone to come home. She rolled pieces of bread in sugar and waited. She didn't want to open the can of little oranges in case her mom really did come back because that was her favorite, her mom's favorite food. And Patricia was running out of sugar. So when a white lady came to the door, she told that white lady she'd go ahead and go home with her. Patricia was 10 years old at the time. By the time young Tom got back from fishing, official people were agreeing with Mabel that she could give the girl a better life than young Tom ever could. 
people like Patricia's teacher and a social worker and a judge, people like that, official people. They told young Tom that seeing his daughter would be a lot easier for him when he was sober, when he had a regular job, and when he could give money to all the official people for all the papers they had to fill out that made it legal by their laws for Mabel to take his daughter away from him. So young Tom sobered up and stayed in town and found a job helping people carry the groceries and rounding up grocery carts and mopping floors and sometimes stocking shelves. Mabel got the pastor of the church right down the street to rent out a part of the church basement so young Tom could sleep there and stay warm. They let him have a corner of the basement Two walls made out of cardboard boxes almost as tall as Tom made a little room that had a bed, he liked to say, that was made out of bed springs and back aches. And two more boxes sat on the floor for clothes and little personal things. It was summer and he was always tired, so he didn't need a lamp. The first time he bumped into one of those walls with his shoulder, he knocked down almost the whole end of the wall. He was amazed. He thought those boxes were heavy, substantial. He thought they had something in them. Those walls kept Tom in and kept Tom out. The pastor told him when he could be by them and when he couldn't be by them. Mabel had said building them was her idea. She said she liked them. Tom tried to respect that, but it turned out those boxes were flimsy. They were empty. He could see that those boxes were made out of nothing. Now, the reason I like this story is because those empty boxes Mabel and the pastor used to make Tom's prison are just like the 19th and 20th century colonial thinking that makes walls to keep people in and keep people out, that says even when an act is unacceptable on its face, it's still OK to vandalize graves and take children if official people say it's OK. Those ways of thinking are stored in empty boxes. And just like the boxes in Tom's basement, boxes made out of colonial thinking are empty. And they will collapse when we push them. A nation's creation myths, its heroes, its explanation of how things came to be the way they are now and why that's a good thing its values, its school lessons, law enforcement, narratives that show us what to consider beautiful, what to consider good, how to act, how to look, how to want to look, what to desire, what to covet, who to be. Those are boxes just like the ones that made the walls in Tom's basement. The walls that young Tom knocked down. The walls we have been told to accept are constructed of 19th and 20th century colonial thinking. Almost every official source describes the long record of native use and occupation that took place before European contact as prehistory. That's an empty box. Indigenous groups possess histories of thousands of years of occupancy and exodus, relocation and settlement, exploration and discovery, embedded throughout the generations in legal process, artistic declaration, symbolic regalia, and oral tradition, at least as accurately, and in many cases more accurately than the European system used for so many years 
to build empty boxes. Before colonial contact, Native cultures possessed vigorous legal systems, effective educational systems, efficient health systems, elaborate social orders, elegant philosophical and intellectual insights, sophisticated kinship systems, complex languages, profitable trade systems, every social institution needed for a culture to flourish for thousands of years. It's a critical element of the colonial narrative that original people of coveted land simply wandered around before first colonial contact, mostly nomadic, with no coherent government structure, sort of digging around in prehistory looking for something to eat. That's an empty box. Today's 21st century narrative, on the other hand, recognizes that before colonial contact, indigenous societies possessed vigorous legal systems that clearly defined land and water rights, clearly affirmed intellectual rights to works of history and works of art, emphatically confirmed social rights and responsibilities attached to rank, marriage, adoption, and addressed all such other matters of concern to the community and the nation. Today's narrative speaks of indigenous education systems that long before colonial contact had already produced leaders, artists, lawmakers, scholars, philosophers, hunters, weavers, carvers, dancers, dreamers all of whom enriched and sustained tribal nations for thousands of years. This is today's narrative. This is the narrative which, within which our stories now find context. We can't deny that we live with residual 20th century thinking, values, beliefs, stereotypes, all of us are subjected to socially defined roles and behaviors. All of us are working out the stories our lives are telling against the backdrop of a national narrative that for much of our lives has too often been composed of artifice, hypocrisy, and arrogance. Boxes that are too often empty. Hypocrisy and failure are essential elements of the colonial narrative we now examine. Shallow pursuits, Cartesian mindsets, categorizing, separating, strictly defining everything from the way children are schooled, the way calendars are constructed, the way time is measured, the way our very lives are sectioned off. But that narrative does not well serve a human way of seeing the world. 19th and 20th century narratives serve colonialism and patriarchy and racism and capitalism, all those empty boxes. But that narrative does not benefit, but rather harms our shared narrative and our own stories, everyone's. We recognize that today's narrative is far more substantial and full of rich context. We also know it's a significant shift, and sometimes we wonder how we'll keep going in that direction. I grew up in the territory of Alaska in the 1950s. I was born at the end of the Second World War in the middle of the 1940s, 1945. I was the only child of an unmarried mother 
When I was almost 16, my mother and I moved to California. 1960s San Francisco sent social messages that were just as strong as those of the 1950s. The cultural narrative different in some respects and similar in many others. Most of the elements of my story were undergoing drastic changes. And as it happened, the national narrative, that larger story, was also undergoing drastic change. Peace marches, anti-war demonstrations, the Grateful Dead, Rocky Horror, Organic Gardening, Back to the Land. There for a minute, it almost looked like the national narrative might be heading in a different direction, a direction that resisted colonial thinking. Well, as you can see, I didn't stay in California. When I turned 40, I decided that I would go back home or I would die trying to get there. It took longer than you'd think it should, but I made it. I ran into unexpected challenges. I dealt with unpredictable issues. I had to satisfy officials. I lived in my car. I stood in food lines. I had to make do. I left the Sierra Nevada foothills and made it to the San Francisco Bay Area. At the end of the summer, I left the Bay Area and made it to Eureka. At the end of winter, I left Eureka and made it to Seattle. And at the end of spring, I made it to Ketchikan and I stayed there until two years later I made it all the way back home to Juneau. That was a long trip. When I started out, I didn't know how I was going to make it all the way. I just pictured myself back home, and I kept on heading north. And I think that's where we are now. We have a picture and we're headed in that direction. We're turning away from 19th and, century and 20th century colonial thinking, and we're changing the national narrative. It's now undeniable to even the most stubborn that indigenous groups possessed and still possess dynamic histories of thousands of years and have kept those histories with elegance and accuracy. The cultural narrative we now share has replaced empty boxes labeled prehistory with boxes full of knowledge, knowledge developed over generations, knowledge that is the result of practical observation, and systematic study of natural phenomena and human behavior, thoughtful assessments of predictable outcomes, intellectually sound conclusions based on data gathered, organized, analyzed, and transmitted to the community and to the next generation in established, tested methods of education and preservation of knowledge. And those boxes of knowledge are not the kind used to build walls. They are boxes that bring light to all of us. The application of that knowledge, when blended with community experience and personal judgment, becomes wisdom. And, trans, and tradition is the transmission of that knowledge, that wisdom, that practice to one another and to the generations. That becomes our narrative. 
that gives context to our stories today. Earlier, I asked you to imagine how things might be had it not been for colonialism, to imagine a different world. We are on the brink of that imagined world. We share a 21st century narrative. When we hear how the Chukanadi earned the devilfish crest, we are witnessing the transmission of knowledge, the preservation of history, a declaration of legal rights, recognition of kinship, and the ceremonial practice of identity. When we learn about Dukdain Tan and Yanyedi crests and Sukhanedi totems, we are witness to highly effective methods of keeping, preserving, and transmitting the history of a people. Our shared cultural narrative will be made rich by voices of Yakutat ancestors and Tekwedi history. Our shared cultural narrative connects us to the history from long ago and to our more recent history when we learn about Morningside, when we are told of the trauma of 19th and 20th century thinking. We're reminded that the effects of that colonial thinking remain fresh in many cases. We're reminded of a collapsed narrative that we were all forced to share. Now, in the 21st century, we are sharing our new narrative. We see ourselves together in a new context when we learn about the National Academy of Sciences, the Constitutional Convention, language revitalization throughout all of it. Our stories unfold within that shared narrative. Our stories connect us to our past and to one another. Cultural narratives teach our relationship to the past, imply our relationship to one another, and shape our relationship to ourselves and to our shared future. And our stories shape our cultural narrative no less than the cultural narrative once shaped our lives. Perhaps more so. We here in Juneau, Zantikihini, are fortunate that the narrative that surrounds us is rich and full of opportunity. Just the other day, I had the good fortune at the place that's now called Akrek to hear Fran Houston talk about how the Ak Kwan welcomed new people from other clans, invited them to be part of the Ak village, to share and become part of their home. We are still welcomed in that way. We are still being welcomed and invited in that way. We're well made welcome and invited to learn about language and place names and history and art, and crests, and balance, and reciprocity, and respect, and meaning, and the life that is present in all things. We are at the brink of fundamental change. We are invited to add our strength to those changes. We're invited to learn about crests in history, kinship, ways of seeing the world that defy colonial thinking, that subdue colonial thinking. And we begin by turning away from the colonial narrative 
opening the boxes of history and knowledge that are not empty. We begin by making strong the cultural narrative we are building today. We first begin with our undisputed testimony that upon colonial contact, indigenous nations were sophisticated and complex and remain so today. Tlingit, Kainak, Sanga Sakt Yukat Du My Klingit name is Sanga Sakt. Tlaitka, Ernestine Hayes, you have to adopt. My white man name is Ernestine Hayes. I am Eagle, Burnt House People, Wolf House, Sheet Gaquan, and I invite all of you to join me as together we craft a new narrative. And I ask you to invite me as you craft new stories and a new narrative. Let's find that new place together. Let's craft that new narrative together. As together we push against those empty boxes and tell stories of truth and respect and reciprocity, as we decolonize, as we smash the patriarchy, as we undo capitalism, as we denounce racism, as we resist 19th and 20th century thinking and tell our stories within a truthful context, as we change our shared narrative and make richer and more meaningful this place, that we are all so fortunate to call home. Let's go forward and craft that new narrative together. Gonna change. Thank you. Thank you. I left room in case there's questions or comments. I would love to hear comments about your new stories, and especially about the, the wonderful programs that are offered here at SHI, the upcoming boxes of light that will be open to us that are evidence, evidence that our legal system, our kinship system, our rights and responsibilities and laws are still alive. They're still here. They've been preserved and treasured by old methods that are still successful. I would love to hear your comments and questions. Before and now, it's grow up or it's go down. How many native people, like oh, like how, eagles or oh, music how, or something? How many clans? Yeah, how many clans and how many in population? Oh, in population, mm -hmm. boy, I don't know. I know Sea Alaska has oh, must be close to twenty thousand. Um, 20,000 shareholders, mm -hmm. and that's just Sea Alaska, and there's other, other, um, other nations, obviously, and other corporations with thousands of shareholders who are native. And here, here in, uh, on Shinkerani, we have the two sides with this complex social structure, thousands of people, I believe that the indigenous people before contact were healthy and numerous. We live in a rich land. We live in a rich land. So it, to my mind, couldn't be any other way. I don't believe that population counts were accurately conducted by colonial people, obviously. Um, so um, I, I can't really put a number on it. Yeah. And one more question. You're talking about part of the history when English colonial 
doctor came here. But do you can you tell something about Russia when it was Russian land? What happened? Did Russia come here? We have a church here not far away. I understand that Russian colony people had different experiences in other parts of Alaska, but it is my belief that here in southeast Alaska, they clung to the coast and they built forts to huddle inside and they didn't go very far into the forest and they left as soon as they were done and the uh, Hindic people never never acknowledged that Russian people had anything but trading rights here in Shinget on mm -hmm. And after all, that's what Russian people were here for, right? They, they really weren't here to, oh, I'm going to take over. They, they were here to trade. And I think that's pretty much all that they did. Um, it's different than the Dix the Yes, 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 for sure. Kind of different. We have an online question uh, from Une Lance Twitchell. Une Chish for sharing a beautiful vision. As you have said, education needs to be place-based education by place-based educators. What else needs to change in order to get there? Well, I think we first begin to change by acknowledging and speaking out our testimony that belies the empty box that Native people were brought education and, and all those health and all, all those things, all those things that supposedly were brought to Native people. I said when I was talking that language revitalization appears throughout all the past, all the present, all the future. There's no accident that people intent on destroying indigenous cultures targeted the language and targeted the children. Well, in the land and riches and dead people's bones and everything else, but as a practice, was the children and the language. I would argue those are the two most important components of culture. We still have our children and Gunnar's cheese. We are seeing our language come back to full life. It wasn't ever dead, but it needed help. And I was fortunate enough to be working at the University of Alaska. And when I saw that whole program, that language, be given life. I would say the children in the language, right? The children in the language. But we also see sophisticated art. Sophisticated art, not only from bringing tradition forward, but creating new art and new traditions. And I know that new words are being created. And children are being taught new truths. I would think that children in language, children in language, everything else will come with it, I would think. Thank you. Cheese. There's another question on, on the live stream. <clears throat> Uh, what do you suggest for those reconnecting to their indigeneity but far from close relatives to learn from? That's really difficult, right? And I said I was going to share a question that um, helps me when, you know, I am, I'm, I'm uh, concerned with mundane 
concerns just like everybody, right? I had a house fire. We all had a pandemic. We don't know what we're going to have for dinner, right? Just all that. And I know that we're not going to make change immediately. But colonization didn't take place immediately. It feels like it, but it, it worked towards its goal. And I think one of the good ways for us to work toward our goal, I ask that question. What would it be like had colonialism not taken place? What would our schools be like? What would our houses be like? What would, what would anything, what would meetings be like? Certainly we'd still have Wi-Fi and Zoom, right? Certainly we'd still have new, new I don't know about new cars. I, I don't think we'd be so dependent on roads. I think we'd have new boats, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I wonder, well, how can we do that? It just seems like such a big, big challenge. So this, this uh, year, my son, Robert Stevenson, and I are working on a uh, Juno School District program for teachers called, as was mentioned, Place-Based teacher, place Teaching by Place-Based Teachers. And one of the guiding rules that I'm trying to enact is what can we do to make little changes to be more like it would if colonialism hadn't taken place? And one of the things we're doing, even though we've already got more than 40 people signed up, is we are going to turn away from single-use plastic. We are going to turn away from paper plates. <laughs> We're not going to use plastic spoons and forks. 40 people, who's going to wash those dishes? But we're going to do it, because I really feel like not only would that be the way we would be had colonialism and capitalism not taken over our lives, but that's what we have to do whether we're interested in indigenous living or not. That's just what we have to do. And so those little changes, we're also making children welcome, right? Because I feel like that's what it would be, right? We'd be more, we'd be more inclusive, right? And so those are little changes, but I believe that little changes can sometimes start a revolution. Just like that first language class has grown into what it is today. So those little changes, I, I'm, I'm making little changes that put my gaze in, in a new direction. And you can, too, whatever little changes you might make. You might not be, you know, I mean, it isn't everyone who has three or four people to wa help them wash 40 dishes. You know, I'm not going to carry them around. <laughs> and so maybe that can't be the way you make a small change. But you can make a change towards that direction in the way that's meaningful to you, that presents as an opportunity to you. Let's all do that. Let's all do that. If you know colonization came here, it's interesting about uh, if it, everything looked in history, have a reason. And maybe like we can tell about night and day, we can tell about the situation in colonization because if you don't have colonization, you won't realize what you are and what you have to fight and what you have to, what is your goal? Because you like, so easy 
didn't see anything, you know. This is, could be reasonable or not. Uh, I, I mean, what's going on in history has come by itself, or we made it. That certainly is a common rationalization, and I certainly can't deny the fact that, you know, invasion is part of human history everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't deny my belief that when when colonies, when American colonization hit us, hit Finge, we were pushing northward. We were pushing northward. There's no way that I think we can say that's not true. And here's an even more controversial belief that I have. I think we were being pushed from the south <laughs> by those Haida people. <laughs> I don't see any way to say that's not true. But I think the impact of a colonization that had as its primary goal, cultural genocide is peculiar, is peculiar, I believe, in many respects, to Euro-American colonization that hit us. I, I think, you know, the natural ebb and flow of nations, indigenous nations, and so on, was not what we see happened. By the, by the acts of land-hungry, gold-hungry, fur-hungry, fish-hungry, timber-hungry people, right? I think it, it was different in many respects. But I certainly don't say that that wasn't happening. Yeah. Here's a, another online question. Uh, do you think it would be helpful for Juno to have a Truth and Reconciliation Committee as a way to work towards decolonization? Hmm. I, um, I don't see, you know, I don't, I don't see anything uh, wrong about that. And I, and I certainly believe a lot of good things could happen by it, right? Um, but I leave decisions about such things as committees <laughs> to people who know better, right? I, I believe that that would be a good idea, and I think it could do a lot of good. And even things that didn't work in the past are going to work now. We are in the 21st century and the 19th and 20th century thinking that prevented us from so many things, that, that guaranteed failure in so many attempts, those boxes, we're pushing them down and those walls no longer exist for us. So let's try it all again. Let's try everything. Do you have some, did you see in your life some unusual stuff? It's not understandable without <laughs> Do you, do you see some unusual stuff here, like your tribes like fix the, fix the health with the, like sounds or something, like something unusual. Did you see any unusual stuff which people, your people can make here? Oh, um, it's my essential belief that here in Juneau, here in Southeast Alaska, here on Thinkinoni, we are so fortunate to benefit from the vision that brought this building, this room, what we see across the street, the art that we see everywhere, this is the place that change is going to happen. This is the stronghold now of our future. That vision has made Juno the place where we can hear our language, we can learn our history, and even as important, 
that the teachings and the lectures and the workshops that have to do with that, everyone is invited to. This is an inclusive culture. This is an inclusive place. We understand that we had a shared past that we're coming out of and we are, we are headed in a shared future, a new direction. So I think we see what Clinket people can do. And we know that everyone can be part of it. I don't know what time it is. I don't have a um, question. I just have a comment. Uh, Alicia Yuchet Duasak. I had the great pleasure of taking a memoir writing class with you about four years ago. And um, I want to share that you helped me reclaim a story that I'd been suppressing for a really long time. Aww. And that has helped me and my family to reconnect and have conversations um, and talk about the truth. And so I just want to thank you, Gunas Chish. Um, you've encouraged me and my friends to have more conversations um, and, and do the work that it takes to, to perpetuate the culture. So, Gunas Chish. Oh, thank you so much. Goodness, geez. Um, I so appreciate that. Goodness, geez. Most noble, Ernestine. Most noble, honorable person. You have just warmed my heart. You give us the kind of optimism that we as a people need to hear more and more. We need to have our natives and non-native friends hear that message, to hear you speak in your eloquent way about the glories of our history, about the glories of our culture, the knowledge that our ancestors bequeathed to us and transferred through thousands of generations Ernestine, you are wonderful. You are wonderful in, in bringing us this positive message that we so need at this point in time in our history. Because we still know we have challenges. But with your words, you give us hope and you give us optimism. Thank you for your very, very eloquent presentation. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the place and we are the people. Let's do it. Thank you. Our next lecture will be Tuesday. And it's presented by Fred Fulmer on how the Chukunadi clan earned the octopus crest. Thank you, Ernestine. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you. I have a question about the religion. How religion come?